Hello and welcome back to As For Me In My House. I'm Jordan. And I'm Elena. And we are very, 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 very excited to be bringing you guys a series on the spiritual. And we're not exactly sure what we're going to even call it at this point, but I don't know. Series in the spiritual sounds cool. Mm-hmm. It's just and so close. so so comprehensive, but yeah, um, we wanted to set up. Melanie and I have not been hesitant to do this, but just feeling the weight of it um, because there's so much. People spend quite literally their whole life in the highest echelons of uh, academia and research and archaeology and and all those ologies, <laughs> and get so many degrees with so many letters after their name, mm-hmm. studying this kind of stuff, mm-hmm. and so. Right off the bat, Melanie and I want to add a disclaimer to say we're not experts. We're not here teaching you guys. We are just simply saying we're students of this material and mm-hmm. we're glad you're along the ride and as we're learning. So we want to share things that we're learning mm-hmm. as we're researching this mm-hmm. and, and hopefully try more, to make, put some sense to it, right? Yeah, and making it a little bit more digestible yes. because there's a lot of stuff that just completely goes over my head. And now knowing the information that I know, the very surface level information that I do know, when I read my Bible now, you guys, I have such a deeper understanding and like what was I reading the other day that it even mentioned a lot of what we're going to talk about today. And I went and looked back at it again today and it felt like I literally had new eyes reading what I was reading and it made so much more sense. What is, were you reading the full armor of God, Ephesians six? No, <laughs> no, I had this open up for some other reason. Oh, I think it was that's, in, that's right on point with stuff that we're yes, going to get into. That too, though. Well. Yeah, no, I can't remember what it was. Um, cause I'm hopping everywhere around in my Bible. So it, I, maybe it was Deuteronomy cause I was reading through Deuteronomy anyway. Um, the reason we're even talking about this is so you have a deeper understanding of God's word. Mm-hmm. We're not trying to add to God's word. God's word is enough. It is living, breathing. He has spoken those words, but us living in the 2023 There is so much context and so much information that we simply do not know because of the times we are living in. And it's kind of funny because now that we've gotten older and we're not like as in tune with like Gen Z lingo, I feel like I'm finally starting to understand things. Like even as I was writing the Esther study, I feel like I had to constantly catch myself wanting to use specific lingo and phrases that people might not understand if they're a little bit older, a little bit younger. Mm -hmm. And so like... That's just something that we have to think about. Is Speaking the of context. the Esther study, if you guys haven't, go check it out. We'll leave a link to Melina's website yeah. down below. But It's a nine-day study. Go go snag it. Uh, we just started going through it with you guys all on, was it Threads? Mm-hmm. Um, the new Instagram, kind of like Twitter for Instagram kind of mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's been great so far. I'm learning a lot. And <laughs> we we started putting stuff together. And then I, now that we're like going through it, we're like, wait, why didn't I see that before? Why didn't... Why did we never know this? So we're like we're learning things now, even going through it again. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, go check that out. Links down below. Yes. But kind of what you're um, saying, honey. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I I just have one more thing to say. Um, we want the Bible to make sense to you, and I think a lot of times people go to outside sources to make sense of what actually happens in mm-hmm. the world, and it saddens me that the Bible isn't the only place that people go to because the Bible is truly the only thing that we need. And has literally answered every question that you might have and has talked about every topic that you might think to talk about. Well, the reason that is is because the church for hundreds of years has discouraged critical thinking and deep questions. It's been just shut up and Do what you're we'll told. tell you what to believe. We'll mm-hmm. tell you what to think. Yeah. So they've discouraged people from going out and searching the scriptures and finding things. So they're going to go to things like Harry Potter or... Um, tarot cards yeah or yeah anything in the occult or witchcraft or whatever and they're going to go to these other sources because they say wow i I realize there's power there there's an attract excuse me there's an attraction there or like the stars what's that astrology Astrology. yeah so all these different things that people will go to paganism yeah i mean all all of these things to say as melana mentioned the bible speaks directly to them if we just Mm -hmm. let the bible speak for itself Mm -hmm. and so when it comes to the spiritual realm Everyone always has more questions than they do have answers. That's very true. Most religions all over the world believe in something beyond just the physical. Mm-hmm. And the fascination with the spirit world is growing at a very rapid rate, especially here in the West, right? Mm-hmm. 
especially at the advent of things like string theory or quantum physics and even psychedelics and people going on these, you know, acid trips, trips to meeting ascended masters and all these other, you know, mm -hmm. uh, intelligent beings. Right. Demons. We're going to try to make sense of all that and parse it all together and it, parse it out for you. Mm -hmm. uh, but the frustration with such an arcane or esoteric topic such as this is the, just the sheer amount of noise mm -hmm. and misinformation and speculation surrounding it. People are like, oh, you know, there's there's such an uptick in the paranormal, you know, like all those paranormal activity movies that came out, you know, years Exorcisms ago. And Exorcist movies, right, from the 70s, I think. Mm -hmm. um, there's just such a fascination in like uh, uh, people trying to, you know, go to mediums and consult the dead and all that stuff. That's all talked about and addressed in the Bible if we just go back and read it or let it speak for itself and mm -hmm. not so much try to force our 21st century opinions on it but let it let's get in the head of the writers in their day and age as they were writing it in their context mm. that's really going to be the key to unlocking a lot of this stuff that we're talking about so and i also think it's important to note that it's not bad to have questions like you just mentioned it's always been pushed against like just be quiet and listen and just believe like you don't have enough faith if you just don't believe everything i tell you what to believe that's a very fine line and misuse and <laughs> Oopsies. Um, and manipulating an abuse of power. It's okay to have questions about these things. And it's okay to go to God's word to seek the answer of those things. What's not okay is to go to outside sources to find those answers. First, seek what God's word says about it. And you'll truly be able to find any and everything that it does have to talk about it. Amen. It's just a little bit... I don't want to use the word harder, but it is complex. It does require a level of understanding, which is why it's so important to completely saturate yourself in God's word. You guys like the enemy knows God's word more than most Christians. And that's a very, very sad, sad statement to make. Like when the enemy came to tempt Jesus, he was tempting him with God's word. Praise the Lord. Jesus knew what he was talking about because he was able to decipher the small little things that the enemy was twisting and manipulating and saying incorrectly. But it sounded real close to what is truly in the Bible. So, again, oversaturate yourself in God's word for you to truly be able to understand. And I think if you don't even have a basic understanding of the timeline that everything took place and um, I don't know, like I think this might be a little bit ahead. I think you really do need to have a basic understanding of like from Genesis to like Jesus's time. Yeah. Like you really beyond. do need to be very on top of understanding like exactly what took place, when it took place, what happened in order for this to happen. Yes. Because maybe if, if like I wasn't really inclined to learn about this four years ago because I truly it went so far above my head that it wasn't even information that would have been beneficial for me to know. But I think now just as I've matured in my faith, matured in my abilities, like Jordan's always been really inclined and very sound in his theology not that not i always. haven't been sound but no. like when he went to I'm school still learning a lot but when you were in school you learned a lot of it and i always felt more so that i was more of a baby christian in that area and i definitely do not feel like that anymore and i think this is really helping me so well just because someone goes to school or has a degree or letters after the name doesn't even make them uh, wise it could just make them an educated fool that's very so true. i think if you are Fear able of the to Lord is the beginning of wisdom so right and then a, a humble and teachable spirit mm. that my professors when I was in seminary they would say I could tell like right away it's hard not to make character judgments about people but sometimes they just can't help it where they'll have you know like reverend doctor whatever phd comma mm -hmm. md comma d m i n it's just like all these like they they get so enveloped in their accolades and in their earthly titles but then and those ones were like I just I'm sorry I just couldn't respect them as much like yeah I respect that you've lived inside of the walls of academia your whole life. But then there were others that came out and they had just as many degrees, but they're like, yeah, just call me Steve. You're like, it's like, Oh, professor. So-and-so, no, no, just call me Steve, you know, mm -hmm. or doctor. No, no, don't call me doctor. You know, like they just, they just wanted to be a, a teaching student. And so mm -hmm. all that to say, um, when it comes from a genuine place to try to find out like answers for all of these things, mm -hmm we have to properly filter this through scripture, like you said. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do that, it can be misleading and even harmful the farther we stray off the course of the Bible. Mm -hmm. So by God's enabling, Melan and I want to be students of the subject matter with you and not only cover a lot of the economy of the spiritual world and the dynamics of it, but also do biblical justice to, to the topic, right? Mm -hmm. And like Melana said, this isn't just like 
a detour uh, tangent, like let's just go off into this like, you know, thing just because we have an interest in it. Like, yes, it does pique our interest, but at the at the heart of it is we want to know God better through His Word. And mm-hmm. um, several several theologians and several uh, people who have done great work on this, we're going to name some of them in in a minute, but and we'll leave their their links in the comments and all that, so you can go and see. Like, nothing is original to us. Nothing is like. Oh, this is Jordan Malena. Like, thus saith Jordan Malena. No, this mm-hmm. is, we're just trying to take from so many different sources and kind of just put some sort of a consistent thread through Make all of them. Make it digestible. Because it's, yeah, because it's just so, like, you can get way in the woods really quickly. So, mm-hmm. uh, but several of these guys have said things like, why is there so much in the Bible? Like, why is it this thick? You know, why mm. why is it four or five inches thick? I wish it was longer sometimes. <laughs> yeah, but it's just, like, if if all we needed to know was, repent and turn Mm. to jesus and he saves you from your sins like Mm. why is there all this stuff like why is there stuff about angels why is there Mm. stuff about demons why is there stuff about the future right like Mm. what's all this about and so if you've ever suspected that maybe there's more to the story than just Mm. the gospel not saying that's a minor part that's obviously the main focus but to understand and fully appreciate the gospel Mm -hmm. there's so much more in the old testament or the hebrew scriptures and even some of the biblical, extra biblical books that were written and common and popular among the authors of their time. And so we're going to explore some of those. We're going to touch on that. Um, and I would also like to say with impunity that this is not talked about in the churches and it needs mm-hmm. to be mm-hmm. like, you're not going to, we're going to cover stuff that you'll never hear a sermon preached on. And I think that's a great, you know, tragedy in, in the church today is like mm-hmm. we, Jackie Hill Perry just posted something that was really fire this really? morning. It was a hot take. I'm love actually going to pull it up because I want to read it and do it justice. But I love Jackie. She uh, she actually took some heat for it. I'm all for creativity and preaching, but this inordinate preoccupation with being clever is concerning. At some point, we have to believe that flat-footed preaching in a plain and ordinary way has more power than it in it than 45 minutes of quotables. Mm. I suspect Amen. that the root of this phenomenon is arrogance, ignorance, and lovelessness. Mm. The arrogant preacher is clever in an attempt to draw people to himself. The pulpit is where they go to feed themselves. The sermon is just a means and a performance. They have to be entertaining because that's what works. Mm. They know that what Paul says about the human nature is true. No one seeks God. And truth be told, these preachers would have to find another job if people actually warned, or sorry, if people actually wanted God. Mm. But here we are. I empathize with the ignorant preacher. Maybe they haven't learned how to get out of the way, nor have they been taught where the preacher's power really is. Illustrations and oratorical shimmying mean nothing if God's oil ain't on it. And hear me when I say, the evidence of oil isn't in the response of the people. Mm. Even false prophets get praise. Mm. Power is located in the preaching of the cross. Mm. That is what the Spirit puts his weight on. At the end of the day, the problem with all of this is lovelessness. Mm. If a preacher really loves God, they will remove every hindrance to his glory being seen. Mm. Out of that would come love for these people coming week after week to see Jesus. People are dead in sin, suicidal, grieving, etc., and we're giving them everything but living water. Mm. We need to repent for getting in God's way and return to preaching Jesus, period. So some wow. people some people like kind of took her to the task on that. Saying, She's talking about TED Talks, like those TED Talks type of church. Okay, we really yeah, got to get into I know, this, honey. I know, I just wanted... We just have a lot to cover today. I was... I'm assuming the folks out there that listen to us are a lot more intelligent than we are. They're going to know that this is a, um, this is a long setup here. This is going to be, this whole episode is going to be an introduction and kind of a 30,000 foot view mm-hmm. so, so that by next week and the following weeks, you'll have a framework and a, um, like building a house, right? We got to start with the foundation yes. and then start framing. And then we can start putting all the, all the little detail pieces after that are really cool. Mm -hmm. But we got to start somewhere with building a foundation because some people are know more about this than we do. And that's awesome. Some people are curious about this and have heard bits and pieces and just don't really know what to make with it. Mm -hmm. Some people are first time they're hearing it and they're like, I'm interested, but I I have have no idea (laughs) what's going on. We're, we welcome all of you guys. We want to have discussions Mm -hmm. in the comments. We want to be able to go back and forth and Mm -hmm. and parse these things out. So this is going to be, just us kind of setting all this up but as we kind of wrestled with the entry point Mm -hmm. for this discussion because it obviously can be all easily scattered and jumping around yes i just want sorry (laughs) i i know i just want to say one more thing before we do jump in that i feel like i've kind of already alluded to this but 
a lot of the questions that I have had about the Bible have been very, very, very clearly answered within learning all of this stuff. For example, what on earth were these women and children doing that the Lord had to literally flood the entire earth to the point where mountains and the entire earth was shaken and sopping wet for 40 days? What were these people doing that called for such a harsh judgment on them so hold on before we before you answer that question i'm not going to answer that question. i know i I understand but before you can even ask that question i should say (laughs) there's a framework and there's a perspective that milan is coming from and again you know we were probably probably a um, broken record at this point but you have to start with the framework of the bible is 100 percent true this is god's word Mm -hmm. to us it's perfect in its originals and we can still understand the the depths and the complexities and the intricacies in the translations today Mm -hmm. that's what makes it powerful and and living and active is god's powerful enough to get us his word he's powerful enough to preserve it throughout this the centuries for all of us so Mm -hmm. all that to say milan is coming when milan asks this question because some people don't believe in the flood they think it's just a story or fantasy so you have to like start somewhere right is what i'm saying you have to where we're coming from is this is true this is a worldwide flood this isn't local this covered the tallest mountains by, I think it was like 40 or 50 feet uh, uh, over the tallest mountains in That's the world. Crazy. I mean, everything, the, the earth was broken up and the fountains of the deep opened and the windows of heaven opened. And mm-hmm. so like, this was just all ensuing chaos on the world. Mm-hmm. And that's what Milan is coming from. So I think that's helpful background context because I, I don't want to had... just assume people are like, what are you talking, you really believe in the flood? Yes, we really believe in the flood because God's word says that happened and you can find evidence of that all throughout archaeology. Well, but yeah, that's the other thing too. We're, There's we're getting off. A tangents. lot of science gets funded to support evolution. A lot of science, and when I say a lot, I mean billions of dollars. Like there is no, there is very minimal funding that goes towards creation. And like the thing is, we all are exposed to the same evidence. And so and I know I'm going to ruffle some feathers with this, but we all have the same evidence and how people look at it can be very, very different. And so we've always only heard one perspective, which is a lot that supports evolution and the earth being millions and millions of years old. And so... Yeah, so where we're coming from is we believe that the world was created in in six 24-hour literal days and God rested on the seventh literal 24-hour day. And I know there's even people in Christendom that disagree and that's okay but when you get into it that's what it teaches so i'm going to let god's word be true and let all men else be all all men be liars because that's what god's word tells us is god's word is true Mm -hmm. so we can trust this you could take this to the bank Mm -hmm. it's not so much oh i well these people were you know smooth brain neanderthals back then actually we're going to learn a lot that adam was probably the the smartest man that's that's completely reversed and again it's another lie of atheism and when you really teach atheism and creationism and evolution versus creationism side by side the reason they don't teach you creation in schools public schools is because if they did no one would believe evolution it doesn't have a monkey leg to stand on it's the theory of evolution as much as richard dawkins and all these other guys want to say it's it's fact it's proven they haven't shown one shred of evidence for macro evolution kinds changing into kinds They just say, oh, with time plus matter plus chance, that's our magic wand that we're going to wave. And now we're going to just play kind of a mental gymnastics game on you and say, oh, if you go back far enough in time and you have enough matter and enough chance, then you're going to get, you know, uh, the perfect conditions for life. So life comes from non-life. That's logical. Wait, I think it takes something comes from nothing. That's scientific. (laughs) And, you know, um, abiogenesis reproduction comes from. Yeah, non reproduction. Preg- pregnancy so. alone is absolutely insane. But you're right. That's that's scientific and, and like the we should laugh at the the people who believe that there was an intelligent creator, God who, okay, who created we, everything. Okay, we're getting off on tangents. We don't need to be talking. We that's we true. can do. That's true. We should do. Okay, because with going into this, you kind of have to have that understanding. That was my whole point, and going off on that. Five you have to understand rant. that we believe that the Bible is true. That like. The, the earth was created in 24 hours, six literal days. That the earth is not a million years old. The earth is probably 7,000. They say 4.5 billion years old, but yeah. But. Close to seven. We're close to 6,000 years of, of earth history. Yes. So with all of that back knowledge, 
completely changes the way that you view the Bible. And so just going forward, know that so, that's where we're coming from. And when we talk about all these things, like if the Bible talks about it, it happened. Okay. And I know a lot of you guys are on board and agree, probably 80, 90%. Mm-hmm. When our goal is to help show you that and make sense of some of the things that you read. Because if you start with a faulty foundation, it's Psalm eleven three says, if the foundations be shaken, what can the righteous do? Mm-hmm. Or the foundations be destroyed. Mm-hmm. So we want to let the Bible start as our foundation and speak for itself. And then now we can build on that because all this is going to matter. You're probably saying like, what is evolution or it the age of the matters. earth? What does that have to it do with what we're talking matters. about here? And that's, that's why, because we're going to get into some stuff that's like hard to believe or hard to swallow at first. And you're like, mm. oh, wow, that's, that's kind of disturbing or I don't like the implications of that. So I'm going to go over here and try to explain it some other way instead mm-hmm. of God forbid we let the Bible speak for itself, right? Mm-hmm. All right, so let's we're going to address some do you want to call them characters? Yeah. We're going to define yeah. some characters. So, moving forward with the previous episodes that we do, they all will kind of need the previous episode to have been watched. So, we're going in with the defining characters and defining specific things. So, because we're talking about the spiritual realm, spiritual warfare and all of the spiritual, we need to kind of make sure that when we speak about something, we're all under the st- under the same understanding of what we're talking about. But it's a so, great tragedy in the church today that we've dismissed a lot of the talk of the spiritual realm because and um I mentioned I'm going to share some names of people that we've been studying and if even when you hear us talk, you're probably going to hear that cuz of people who have influenced us, but we're really indebted to Dr. Michael Heiser, who unfortunately passed away about four or five months ago. Um, brilliant um, Hebraist and, and scholar who studied this stuff and really put sense of a lot of the scriptures together. Mm-hmm. But he talks about this exactly what Melana is saying is like, the reason why we're so unfamiliar with these characters is because we just in the church kind of paint everything with a broad brush stroke. And, you know, the good guys are angels and the bad guys are demons and we'll call it good, you know, and, mm-hmm. How does Jesus help me, uh, you know, be more successful in my business? Like that's that's the tragedy that we've come to in our in our TED Talk church. Mm. So what we're trying to do is rediscover the scriptures in these things and the original text. And what do they all mean? Because all these characters and and uh, classes, if you will, of spiritual beings all matter and all have something of significance here in the in the larger epic of the Bible. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, we have the physical world which we all clearly live in right now mm-hmm. we can physically see each other like i know that i am standing right here in front of jordan you're sitting but go ahead yeah i'm sitting right here in front of jordan <laughs> and i can like physically see him and then we have the spiritual world spiritual realm and those are things that we cannot physically see and there are different characters that are mentioned all throughout scripture and we want to break them down because there are angels, there are demons, there are principalities, and then there's the Elohim. So we're going to break down each of those because there are different arcs of angels. There are different arcs of demons. They're very specifically laid out and sometimes it can get lost in the text or like sons of God. I can't even begin to tell you how many times I've read that over and never even thought twice about what it was that I was Jesus reading. Jesus calls himself the son of God, but we also see sons of God all throughout the Old Testament referenced mm-hmm. in what we would understand them as angels, right? Mm-hmm. And so before you start defining each of the subclasses, let's just talk about the word angels for a second. Mm-hmm. Again, Heiser's got a great book. Um, you literally have an angel. That well, was... Uh, that was the depiction of what on purpose. All right, was this is, it? This is the New Earth final chapter. So and angels aren't as pretty as we think they are. This is a very like um, romantic era um, Renaissance type like depiction of angels. When we see angels um, in the scriptures, we see several different classes of them. Mm-hmm. But the word angel, it's not an it's not a word of onco- ontology. <laughs> I almost said oncology ontology meaning like what their essence is Mm. it's a job description it's what they do it's not who Mm. they are so angel means messenger Mm -hmm. we use the word when we say an angel of the lord or the angel of the lord that's Mm -hmm. saying a messenger so really what you get that's their role so melena is a mom and we our kids would refer to her as mom but mom is not her name it's Mm. who she is right Mm. it's Mm -hmm. your it's, sorry, it's, it's not who she I is. Do. It's her role, right? Mm-hmm. So she's a mom. She mothers. She's a wife. She 
wives, I guess, you know, like you, you see what I'm saying? Like there's a difference between the, the essence of the person and what they do. Mm. And that's what we get in, in the scriptures with angels. Angels are messengers. Mm -hmm. We get the description with like the wings and, uh, Ezekiel talks about the wheel within the wheel with the eyes and all this stuff, right? Like there's, we get these other descriptions and depictions of we angels. We will link below because there is a really cool account that um, is on Instagram and they will put in AI what the Bible reads. The AI Bible? Yeah, yeah it's really cool. And yeah, they have a Not image. to be confused with the like satanic AI Bible that they're trying to like rewrite the scriptures. We're, we're not talking about that. Like that's no, that's no. on the conversation table right now is... Oh, we need to rewrite the Bible um, using AI because it's, you know, this, that, the other. It's not, this it's not account. appropriate for today. But this is actually something that takes. It's really cool. It it makes photos, AI illustrated pictures. Yes. Of so what we read in the it, actual Bible. It gives an example of like angels would have looked would have looked like, which is like circles of eyes and stuff. Like, because if have you ever noticed when you are reading and an angel comes, like to Mary, the first thing they say is, "Do not be afraid." Why on earth would I need to be afraid if this beautiful thing approached me? I wouldn't be afraid of that thing. They're terrifying they, looking. They, they do they're not so, look like... Melana mentioned the physical and the spiritual. That was part of God's plan in the very beginning was to have a heavenly family with his sons of God, the angelic realm or the another word that Melana mentioned, Elohim. It means God or gods, right? Mm -hmm. And we're confused when we, when we see that word translated because we're, ta we're taught in the church to think a certain way about G-O-D, the, the letters G-O-D, God, we, we automatically in our mind ascribe a certain amount of, a uh, certain set of attributes to that. When we talk about God, capital G-O-D, we know him as, you know, the, the God, the Father, right? Or mm -hmm. God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But that's not what Elohim means. Elohim is a, again, a, I guess a that class. could be the first thing that we characterize. Then. Yeah, that's, the that's first probably defining helpful. character that we're doing is Elohim. As you can see, you know, we're we're still like, where do we jump in There's here? There's just so much. Yeah, go ahead. Elohim. But but all all to say, Elohim is a word that just means gods or God. It depends on the context and how it's used in the grammar. Um, there are multiple Elohim. There's several Elohim, but there's one that is uncreated. There's one that's the most high. There's one that stands out from all of the other ones. And this Elohim, we know as Yahweh. That is the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting when you start getting into some of the scriptures, and we're going to do that a little bit here, but you'll notice Psalm 82 is a chief text where God is speaking to the divine council. And this is what's known as a a council is like a group of people that are all, or beings, let's just say, that are all advising Psalm, Psalm, what? Psalm 82. And it says that y Yahweh stands in the midst of the, defi the, the divine assembly, in the midst of the gods. Why don't you go ahead and read it from uh, verses 1 down to 4. Okay. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Wait, hold on. Pause there for a second. So God is in the midst of the gods. And for a long time, I and others have understood this to be like very powerful men on the earth, but humans. And that's not what you get when you understand the, the scriptures from a uh, even a ancient Hebrew perspective. What you'll understand is like they believed in these lower Elohims, lowercase g-o-d-s. When, when you go to the Hebrew... It, what is the word Elohim? For gods? Okay, so it's it literally would say Elohim has taken his place to find counsel it says in Elohim the midst of the Elohim. But when you look at the first one where it says God, as we would translate it, capital G to to speak of Yahweh, it says takes his place. So it's Elohim as a plural, grammatically, but it's the the um, pronoun there is singular male, so his. So like, how do you, how does that work? You know, this is, this is more getting into like language 101, but. Which is very important too. What's interesting though, is you see God takes his place in the divine council amidst the gods. Now go over here to verse six of Psalm 82. And this is God pronouncing a judgment on the lower gods who were put over the nations and put in charge of all the different mm -hmm. um, people groups all around the earth. And 
he's disappointed with them. They did something wrong, which we're going to get to in future weeks, but something happened and he's now excoriating them and putting a judgment on them. So this is what the most high God says. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about the darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, son of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall in any prince. Fall like any prince, right? Mm -hmm. So there's some interesting words used there, right? God, the most high says, you are gods, but you're going to die like men. Hmm. And so there you have a difference even in their ontology of spirit beings, lesser Elohim that are part of the spiritual realm. And then you have the men there that it's so like you're going to die like men. God's pronouncing, Yahweh's d pronouncing this judgment on them. And he says, uh, you shall fall like any prince. And now you have these, a prince is like a, a ruler, right? It's, a, it's mm -hmm. a position for, it's a title for a ruler over a territorial or geographic area. Mm -hmm. And so you see in Psalm 82, you're like, oh, that's kind of weird. Like you kind of scratch your head and you're like, God, God's like, what's Especially going on the here? the Psalms. You know? so yeah, so things like that, that's kind of one of the, one of the examples and we're going to revisit some of this in, in the future but mm -hmm. um we'll kind of put a pin in that for elohim right now but just yeah in short it's a word used just for any being that's part of the spiritual realm is what elohim is so yahweh the most high he is an elohim but he's above all the other elohims he's the most high god mm -hmm. he there's no one like him he's uncreated he's the creator of all things. He's the ruler of all things. He's established all things and created all things, right? So that's the most high God. Mm -hmm. But then you also have other lowercase g gods called Elohim. And then those have different classes. So we're going to get into those now. The other classes of of Elohim. Before we do that, though, we want to take a quick break to thank Relief Band for sponsoring this episode. And I remember going fishing with my dad and a couple uh, law enforcement buddies, and we were only out on the Detroit River, but it was very rocky. I couldn't believe we were just on a river. And the boat started like side by side, and we, were, we weren't even just dropping anchor and sit, like we were actually going over some waves. And I'm not really one to get seasick, but I had my relief band on, and I remember thinking, okay, I'm feeling a little bit nauseous, but it could be a lot worse. Um, and it probably didn't help that I had a pretty heavy lunch earlier. But nevertheless, it really did help me with my seasick or motion sickness. Maybe it's, you know, you don't do well on the cars. Like Melana just came back from a long car trip. And being in the very far back, you kind of get a little woozy being in the car seat. So if that sounds like something you're familiar with or can relate to, then you need to try Relief Band. Relief Band is the number one FDA cleared anti nausea wristband that has been clinically proven to quickly relieve and effectively prevent nausea and vomiting associated with motion sickness, anxiety, migraines, hangovers, morning sickness, chemotherapy, and so much more. Every parent should have a relief band on hand or in their first aid kit. We use it when anyone in our family gets nauseous and it's even safe for pregnancy. So the Peace of Mind Relief Band provides makes it worth every penny. In case I wasn't clear, Relief Band is legitimately a band you wear on your wrist to give you relief from nausea, and it uses special technology that works with your body, so it's safe, it's drug-free, and has zero side effects. It's really that simple. So if you've always had a flashlight on hand for a blackout or a first aid kit on hand for emergencies, then you need a Relief Band for those unexpected nausea moments. Right now, we've got an exclusive offer just for As For Me and My House podcast listeners. If you go to reliefband.com and use promo code MYHOUSE, you'll receive 20% off plus free shipping. So head to R-E-L-I-E-F-B-A-N-D.com and use our promo code MYHOUSE for 20% off plus free shipping. All right, so let's get some of the classes of what we would understand to be angels. Mm -hmm. And Melana's going to reference some scriptures here, and I'll kind of, I'll give the name and then you can reference the scriptures. Okay. So if you want to go do your own homework and research these things and see kind of we will also, where they come up with. And we'll link and write everything out too so you can go exactly back. When things are so like spread out all throughout, you're constantly going back and forth and just like mm -hmm. jumping around. That's why Melina said she jumps around a lot in her Bible mm -hmm. because there's so much like cross references. When you have like a prior understanding, you go, wait a second, I just read about this over, over two books yeah. ago or wait, that was last chapter, and now here it is again. Why is it there again? Or 
well, that's New Testament stuff, but it's appearing way back here in the Old Testament. So all that to say, when we get to, you know, the good guys as we understand them, the the holy ones of God, those are his his righteous angels. And so we see, you know, all these different classes such as archangels, cherubim, seraphim, and we know a couple of them by name, such as Michael, the archangel. He's mm-hmm. the one that in Revelation will, um, you know, destroy Lucifer in the end. Mm-hmm. And then you have uh, Gabriel, who appears as a messenger to bring a word from mm-hmm. the Lord to Mary, right? She's going to have a son. You see him come to, um, gosh, so many times all throughout the scriptures, but that's probably the most notable instance is Mary. And so you see these angels again saying, don't be afraid. But then you also see them delivering a word and then talking about, you know, I have to, for example, in Daniel chapter 10, there's this idea of um, this angel was trying to get through to bring Daniel a a word for 21 days, but he was resisted by the prince of Persia. And you're like, Mm -hmm. huh, that's interesting. What, like, what is that all about? Mm -hmm. And then he says, then I have to go fight the prince of Greece who's coming, but Greece wasn't coming for hundreds of years. So it's like in the spirit world, there's a difference in them not being bound by time, whereas we are bound into time. So Mm -hmm. it's very, we're, we're limited. And that's why uh, Hebrew says that Jesus uh, was a little bit lower than the angels for a time being when he was here on earth and he was bodily, uh, you know, bodily uh, um, d- dwelling. So he had all the fullness of God, but he emptied himself, as Paul says, so that he could be limited by flesh and bone. Like we're we're very limited. That's why Paul says, don't you know you're going to judge angels one day mm. because we're going to be made glorified in a completely new body and a completely new appearance Whereas one day we're going to be like Jesus in the sense that we're not going to be constrained by sin and by death and by um, corruption and that we'll be completely freed from all that. So he's going to call us his siblings, which is like, I can't even wrap my mind around that, you know? So Mm -hmm. it's pretty awesome. What an honor. But that's what we see in the angels here. And so... If you want to check out these verses, Melania's going to read them off, and we'll you want put me to them read in. off all of them. Well, we, we could put like them in the one? we could put them in the description. Okay, yeah, because they're all referenced all throughout Scripture, and I guarantee these have been things that you have read and just didn't really think much about. Um, so, yeah, there's we will list every single one of them. Do you want to list them off one more time? Yeah. So w- the different types of angels we see, or angelic beings, we see archangels cherubim seraphim and then we get to the bad players or the bad guys again the church just calls the good guys angels the bad guys demons and leaves it at that but the bible's so much more intricate than that and so we know that's there were angels that had fallen right that there's fallen angels that there's Mm -hmm. those who left their first estate or rebelled um lucifer was the first rebel so he Mm -hmm. left god's family in heaven and said, I want to be like the Most High. I think mm-hmm. it's Isaiah 41 or 42 mm-hmm. or Isaiah 14. He says, uh, I want to ascend my throne above and be like the Most High. So he was cast down to earth. So he, in his, in his vain, prideful desire to be higher than Yahweh, he was actually cast lower. Mm-hmm. And so when. And he took angels with him. Yeah. And we see them rebelling too. You know, we see them. So you get the watchers, right? The, the You see that in extra biblical books like Enoch or um, a couple others. But then Daniel also references the watchers and you're like, what, what is that? Where does that come from? Like you can't, you don't read just the, the canon of scripture, which we, which we would call the 66 books from Genesis to Revelation um, as inspired by the Holy Spirit. You don't get that. But Daniel knew about the Watchers. They read books like Enoch in their day and age. So there was Mm -hmm. an understanding. And even in the New Testament, Enoch is referenced over a hundred times. It's directly quoted by Jude and by Peter. And so you see these strings of like, well, yes, it's not divine inspired scripture, but it was important history and, and what the Jews at that time, the the second temple uh, era, or also 
pre that they understood these books and were aware of the, the traditions and the history there. Mm-hmm. It'd be no different than you or I going to uh, any histori- any historical reference and reading what they wrote and saying, okay, this isn't necessarily God's word, but what they wrote happened as historical accuracy and historical documentation. So mm-hmm. that's that's kind of the way that we approach Enoch is it's not divine, but it's helpful context to know more about what audience and and author in the scriptures talked about so or or what they would have been familiar with in other words and so yeah you get these watchers and we're going to unpack them in in the future here but you're like what is what's a watcher like i don't i don't understand that and then you get to the other demonic entities or or we'll call them demonic entities for sake of words here but uh you get the shadim the rephaim the nephilim and you get these unclean spirits or bastard spirits, and you're like, what, what does that come from? Where's that all found in, in the Bible, right? And mm-hmm. so a lot of stuff we just either assume or take for granted or don't really have much of a frame of reference for. But when you start looking into some of the outside biblical sources that the biblical authors were familiar with and, and read and understood, then you could say, huh, that's helpful context to know what we're talking about here. And our operating rule of thumb is if it if it's scripture scripture's paramount right that's nothing is on the same level as scripture but scripture but if there's anything that doesn't disagree with scripture we just hold on to it and say yeah it's helpful useful information it's good to know mm-hmm. anything that d- disagrees with scripture or contradicts it we just throw it out and say this isn't mm-hmm. this isn't healthy or good right so when you get to those extra biblical books enoch uh yasher and Jubilees, those are books that the Jews were familiar with and, and read and understood. So mm-hmm. that's where you get a lot of these, con- more of a framework for these concepts. And then you get this idea that Paul writes a lot about the principalities, the powers, the authorities, the rulers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, those aren't and- just talking about earthly kings. Those are spiritual Elohim or s- spiritual beings that are put in place certain territory and certain geographies Mm -hmm. um, for specific reasons. That happened after the Tower of Babel. Exactly. Yeah. And so (laughs) it's kind of been a a long intro, but that's kind of setting up a little bit of the the, what's involved, who the players are, Mm -hmm. the whole reason why we're addressing this. Mm -hmm. And um, in the future, I promise I'm going to let Melana do more of the talking, but we're going to go through the three rebellions, as Dr. Heiser puts it. Um, that led up to why we find ourselves in such a uh, um, evil world. Because if you ask the normal Christian that goes to church, what's their answer going to be? Why is the world the way that it is? Because of sin. Right, but which which sin in particular? Like, when did it happen? Eve. Adam and Eve, right? The temptation in the garden. Mm-hmm. But if you talk to a, a a Jewish person or somebody who understood the the, the scriptures in their in their day, that's not what you would get. You wouldn't get that answer. You'd get three responses for why the world is and the way will, that it is and where evil comes from. And so. we will save those for the next episode. Yeah, so join us next week and we're going to talk about these characters and how they fit into the three rebellions mm-hmm. and the three causes of evil, if you will, in the world. So <laughs> you got anything? To, I, I want you to have the last word. Honey. I did a lot of talking. Oh, I don't have a last word. Um, don't let this intimidate you. Don't let it scare you. If anything, let it be a something that helps you want to further read God's word. Um, because I think a lot of times people are like, I don't understand God's word. Like I get overwhelmed. And so let this be an instrument or a tool to help you further understand. Because I think answering a lot of these context questions and having other ideas of what was going on in the world really helps understand God's word and what was going on. Um, and just visually too, like that AI thing, I think it's so cool to like possibly know what angels could have looked like based off of what it is described to visually see that in a 2D, 3D form. And you also have to remember Mm. that like the spiritual realm is 4D, 5D. There's like so many other Ds and dimensions that we are just so limited to our dimension. Yeah. We're, we're closed off to above three dimensions. We basically have three and a half dimensions. Mm-hmm. Time, um, time being the half dimension that only goes in one direction mm-hmm. forward. So, um, Elohim and uh, spiritual beings are not 
necessarily limited to those in that same way. And of course, Yahweh, the most high, is not bound to all of that. He can mm -hmm. see it all and interact with it all mm -hmm. outside of the realm of time and, and matter and space. So mm -hmm. well, I have homework for everyone. It's mind boggling. But yes, let's let's have I some homework. The So if you guys are familiar with the show, I've said it a couple of times, but um, it's a show called Superbook. It's a children's show, but they do a really good job of showing the spiritual realm and what the angels would have looked like, what demons would have looked like, what God's throne. Like, obviously, we all have to take it with a grain of salt because we truly will never know until we are there. But it does a really good job of showing what it possibly could look like. Mm -hmm. And there is a specific um, episode. It's on the book of Revelation. And I really like that episode because it shows Michael. It shows what Michael could have looked like. Like, it just, it really just shows like this true battle and puts into perspective what like spiritual warfare and spiritual battle can look like and just makes it more real and more it just brings the text to life if you are visual like moi yeah especially so, if, if you have kids you don't need to have kids. no don't have it's, your kids watch that it, it's well, not i wouldn't have your kids watch it unless they're above the age of eight yeah it, it's it could be a little scary like some of the some of the stuff that they the see the devil but, is very scary looking in that show but yeah i mean that's something where you could watch it but my point was you could watch it with as your a, kids or without your kids? As a, an adult, you know, yeah. it's not just for kids. I watch Superbook when my kids go to bed, so judge me. No, it's... It's a great show. You won't be judged because you do watch Superbook. Yeah, without... Oh. Huh? <laughs> it's no, a, like, it's a good like, thing. Like, it's not a... Oh. It's not something to judge someone on. All right. But at any rate, we'll end it here. Um, if you guys are interested in learning some more stuff we're gonna leave some links and references and other resources and other materials and stuff mm -hmm. we've been learning from in the comments and we're just getting started and yeah hopefully that was kind of a good little primer for like all right here's what we're gonna get into now let's start going through it kind of systematically to p try to put some sort of um, sequence to it all mm -hmm. so all right guys we'll see you next week bye <laughs>